I'm very honored to introduce our next speaker, covering one of the most important topics for young liberals in Europe today. There's a battle that we're continuing to fight, even decades, centuries, and thousands of years after we began fighting it. And that is the freedom to speak whatever we want, whenever we want, without the fear of any type of aggression towards us, with any type of cultural pressure. This is what we've been fighting for a long time, and we have warriors that are fighting for this right each and every day. One such warrior is right in front of us today. He's the Danish journalist, he's the foreign affairs editor of a great Danish newspaper. We have Mr. Fleming Rose. He gives these speeches all over the world, talks about the importance of free speech, the importance of journalists, of commentators, of people like you and me being able to write and say what we want without the fear of offending people and having retribution against us. While he's writing books all over the world, traveling, sharing this message, at the same time, he's continuing to push the journalistic enterprise that brought him to fame, to glory, and all those terrible images that we saw on television many years ago of burning Danish flags, of, of protests all over the world. For many of us in the West, we did not understand exactly what this was about in the very beginning, but now we know. We know that it is a bigger fight, and we have great warriors like Mr. Fleming Rose to thank. There were not just cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad which were published. They were an expression that a newspaper was not going to cower to the interests that tried to shut it down, simply for spreading a message, a picture, a cartoon. The same fate that we thought belied the journalists and cartoonists at Charlie Hebdo, and we all know too well what happened there. We're very, very honored and very proud as European Students for Liberty to have Mr. Rose here. He just released a brand new book that he will be willing to sign after the speech called Tyranny of Silence. If you have not read it yet, obviously it's available on Amazon, a great read. You'll have some copies here available to sign. And also, if you'd like to keep his uh, reading and writing in your heart, you can also check out the Hidden's Post and newspaper, check out the Foreign Affairs articles, all edited by Mr. Rose. I could continue on. There's much more I could say about such a man, a journalist, a hero of mine, someone who was there in Russia, reporting, translating books and works. Much more that I can say. But now I'm going to yield the floor to our very, very special guest, Mr. Fleming Rose. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yael, for this kind introduction. Um, it's an, a privilege to be here and speak to this uh, audience uh, that values uh, freedom. We need more of uh, your kind of organizations in Europe. If uh, liberty is to survive in uh, this very new complicated, complicated world. Um, I think I'll try to cut short my remarks to about 30 minutes, plus minus. Uh, so we'll have time for questions from you. This is an issue that uh, everybody has strong opinions about, so I'd be happy to, uh, to answer your questions uh, at the end. Um, what I'm saying uh, today is the result not only what I experienced um, almost 10 years ago during the so-called uh, Danish cartoon crisis, but it's also the result and the consequence of myself traveling around the world in the aftermath of the cartoon crisis. Uh, I think I spent almost five years traveling to places like Doha, uh, 
Jerusalem, the east and the west coast in the US, to Moscow, to northern Europe, to southern Europe, and participating in these kind of debates uh, all over the world convinced me about the fact that this is a global debate. It's not a debate that we can uh, limit to a national level, all those, although these debates also are going on on national levels. Uh, but it's a global debate and everywhere I went, I think uh, the debate was basically the same. Uh, how do you balance free speech on the one hand against other kinds of considerations uh, on the other? The difference being that in different parts of the world you would make the slice of the cake in, uh, in different ways. But very few people would say openly that they are against free speech. But then comes the next sentence, I'm for free speech, but... And then you have all uh, the limitations that people are in favor of. Um, I think that there are basically two factors that uh, drives or informs um, uh, the debate about free speech in a globalized world. The one factor is technology. The fact that we are living in a digital world. Uh, the fact that what is being published in a small country like Denmark with a population of five million people and a language that very few people speak is immediately published everywhere when it's uh, on the web. And it's not only being published, um, it's also being reacted to by, by people in, in faraway worlds. If, um, if you take a village or a small town in a country like Pakistan, if 50 years ago, maybe these people through their whole life would uh, meet maybe 100, 200 people and they wouldn't know what was going on 100 kilometers away. Today, they know what is going on 5,000 kilometers away and even if they, if they cannot read and write, they react to events in faraway countries politically. This is a very new situation that we have to deal with. And when information travels, as I experienced at the time of the Khartoum crisis, uh, context is getting lost. And when context is getting lost, you create a lot of room for manipulation and misunderstanding. So this is the one factor uh, technology that we have to, to deal with in, uh, when talking about uh, free speech in a globalized world. The other factor has to do with migration. The fact that more and more societies in the world, not only Denmark, also other parts of the world are getting more and more diverse when it comes to culture, ethnicity and religion. Um, and um, it means that people with very different convictions, with very different lifestyles, with very different religions, ideologies, and uh, uh, adherences uh, have to live side by side. Uh, and that is also new. And I think these two factors are not going to go away, uh, even though there are political forces who do not welcome uh, at least migration. You have strong movements in Europe uh, against uh, uh, immigration, but I don't think um, um, I don't think we will, see, we will see more homogeneous societies. I think we will see more and more heterogeneous societies. So those are the two factors that we have to deal with. And then the question becomes, um, how do you safeguard free speech in a world where information travels, where contexts are getting lost, and a lot of people 
will be offended what by, is by being said in faraway countries. And in a world where societies are getting more and more diverse and we have very different opinions about things and therefore people will also have clashes over ideologies, religions and so on and so forth. Uh, how are we going to do that? And, and I will come back to uh, this in the end of my talk um, and, and give my answer to that question. Um, in the meantime, I think in order to uh, defend free speech in a globalized world, we need an international common standard for limitations on speech. Um, we need a gold standard. Uh, and that gold standard used to be embedded in uh, the UN Decla Declaration on Universal Human Rights and the uh, UN Covenant on Political and Civil Rights that stipulates a right to freedom of expression. But the Covenant also stipulates certain limitations on speech, incitement to hatred, and so on and so forth. And, and, and that clause is being used by more and more countries to put new limitations on speech. So instead of uh, creating a common international standard for limitations on speech, you see a fragmentation of the concept of uh, free speech, with more and more countries passing laws that takes into consideration their own culture, their own religion, their own understanding of history, their own political ideology, and so on and so forth, and they try to protect them against criticism. So, in fact, the common standard, um, international standard of free speech is being undermined. And this is not something that I just, you know, uh, invented. I'm referring to um, uh, a former uh, Hungarian dissident, uh, Miklas Harsti, ha Harashti, who for nine years was a press freedom uh, representative for the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. That covers, I think it's 56 countries in Europe and Asia. And, and, and he arrived at this conclusion after having traveled around these countries and, and, and defended freedom of, of the press in, um, in, in, in Europe and, uh, and Asia. So things are moving in um, in the wrong direction. Um, and it means that instead of underlining and defend, defending the fact that, it is, hum, that it, it is human beings who enjoy civil rights and human rights, it's becoming more and more common to insist that religions cultures, certain versions of history enjoy rights uh, and protection against criticism, which is exactly the opposite as it should be. Um, how does this development come about? I think there are uh, probably many reasons, but I think it unfortunately all started in Western Europe. Uh, you know, one of the more democratic parts of the world, the, uh, the cradle of the Enlightenment uh, and a lot of good things. Um, but, but this notion that, um, that, that you, you have a right to protect certain sensibilities against um, uh, criticism or Defamation uh, started in Western Europe with the passing of laws against Holocaust in Ireland. Um, when I wrote my book, The Tyranny of Silence, uh, I, I started this issue because I was quite often confronted with, you know, 
the analogy, the so-called, the, the proposed analogy between uh, cartoons and uh, criticism of uh, Islam and what happened to the Jews in Europe in the 20s, 30s and 40s. I think it's strange um, um, comparison, but nevertheless, it, it, um, it, provo it, it stimulated me to go back and look into these laws. And I, f I found out to my surprise that the vast majority of these laws were in fact passed after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after 1989, the year of the liberation and, um, and reunification of, uh, of, of Europe. Um, and uh, of course it started in, in Germany, Austria, Switzerland a little bit earlier, but uh, step by step, more and more countries in Europe um, have passed laws criminalizing denial of, uh, of, of the Holocaust. Um, of course, Holocaust denial is stupid, it's, it's a lie, it's, uh, it's a fact that the Holocaust took place, but I don't think that we fight these stupid ideas and opinions by banning them. And in fact, it has... Um, it has passed the way for a wave of similar laws in other parts of the world. Um, in 2008, the European Union passed a so-called framework decision obligating every member country of the European Union to pass laws against Holocaust denial. Um, I think today Maybe 17, 18 countries in Europe um, have these laws. Fortunately, we do not have them in Denmark. Uh, we've, we refuse to pass these kind of laws and, and, and said, you know, we have a law criminalizing uh, incitement to racism and that is enough uh, to fight uh, this. Um, but but in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, they passed uh, these laws, but then they added their own laws because they did they did suffer for, for communi uh, they, they suffered from com from communism far more than they suffered from Nazism. So that they passed laws criminalizing denial of the crimes of communism in Poland, Lithuania, uh, the Czech Republic, Hungary. Um, Ukraine uh, is about to pass a law criminalizing denial of the fact that, uh, that Ukraine uh, experienced a forced famine uh, by Stalin in 1932 and 1933, uh, which in fact would make it very difficult for a lot of historians to go to Ukraine because it's a legitimate uh, discussion among historians whether uh, Stalin was targeting Ukrainians uh, um, specifically or whether the famine was part of a larger picture in uh, the Soviet Union. You had um, a lot of people dying from hunger in Russia, in Kazakhstan, uh, in the Volga uh, uh, region. But nevertheless, uh, and, and, and the Ukrainians are referring to uh, the experience with Holocaust denial laws when they do this. Um, Latvia uh, last year passed a law criminalizing denial of the fact that Latvia had been occupied first by Nazi Germany and then by the Soviet Union. And also last year Russia uh, also referring to the experience of Western Europe and referring to the Nuremberg uh, trial uh, that also serves as the legitimization of the Holocaust denial laws. Uh, Russia passed a law criminalizing um, criticism of the behavior of the Soviet Union during the Second World War. That's a pretty broad definition. Um, which means that my good friend Antony Biva, uh, who wrote a very good book about the fall of Berlin and the crimes that Soviet soldiers committed while in Berlin uh, doesn't want to visit uh, Russia anymore. 
So we have seen more and more of these laws protecting certain national uh, sensibilities in a situation where speech does not know borders anymore and when information travels. And I think it creates a lot of tension and it, uh, it, it serves as a battleground because it's very clear that, um, that, that, that people in other parts of the world try to influence uh, the status of, speech, of free speech in other parts of, uh, of, of the world. Um, the, the Holocaust denial laws um, were based on a certain reading of why the Holocaust happened. Um, and this also goes back to my experience uh, during the Khartoum crisis because a lot of people said to me, oh, you should be careful with targeting a weak minority like the Muslims in Europe because we know what happened to uh, the Jews in uh, Europe, in Germany in the 20s and 30s with anti-Semitic cartoons and, and, and things like that. And, and the understanding being that evil words will sooner or later lead to evil deeds. That if you, if you allow, if you do not ban hateful speech, it will more or less automatically lead to violent crimes at some point. Uh, it's also based on an understanding of Weimar Germany as a place where you had almost unlimited free speech, which is not the case. Uh, so I went back and I studied the, uh, the uh, Weimar Republic uh, um, in, in the 20s and beginning of the 30s, and I found out that this is a very uh, exclusive reading of, um, of uh, what led up to the takeover of power by Hitler in 1933 and later to the outbreak of the Second World War and the Holocaust. The fact of the matter is that in Weimar Germany you had hate speech laws protecting the Jews against uh, anti-Semitism. You had three kinds of laws um, uh, against hate speech. And if you take some of the most prominent uh, Nazis, Josef Goebbels, who was uh, the propaganda minister of Hitler, uh, he was being taken to court by the vice police director of Berlin then, Bernhard Weiss, who was Jewish, and Goebbels lost all the cases uh, for making these anti-Semitic uh, statements. And if you take Julius Streicher, the executive editor of Der Stürmer, a Nazi magazine that was founded in 1923, and that a magazine that published so, some of these very vicious uh, anti-Semitic uh, cartoons uh, throughout the 20s and the 30s. Uh, Streicher was executed in 1946 after being convicted at the Nuremberg trial for war crimes. But in the 20s, uh, Julius Streicher, in fact, was uh, taken to jail twice for his anti-Semitic uh, statements or for what he published in uh, Der Stürmer. And if you take Der Stürmer, uh, I think it was taken to court or being confiscated by the German authorities, the Weimar authorities, 36 times during the course of 10 years, from 1923 until 1933. I mean, after 1933, it doesn't make sense to talk of anti-Semitism in the context of free speech because you just had one ideology in power and there was uh, opponents of, uh, of, of Hitler were not, were not allowed to, uh, to speak out uh, against the regime. So it's not true that, uh, that, that uh, it was because of too much free speech and uh, 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 that, that anti-Semitic statements were being, you know, allowed across the board, that, um, that, that, uh, that created the ground for what happened uh, uh, during the Second World War. I would say otherwise, the story about the Weimar Republic and anti-Semitism was that you had a state that was not able to protect the civil liberties of its citizens. So you had radicals on the left and radical on the right who, uh, who, um, who, uh, who could attack 
people uh, without the state being able to protect their right to speak out against them. Um, so I think we have to go back um, uh, and and have a debate about the master European narrative. The, the, the master narrative for European integration is, in fact, the Holocaust, and and it is this master narrative for European integration that informs um, uh, the kind of limitations that we need on uh, on speech, because people. Uh, fear a repetition, of course, of what happened uh, uh, during the Second World War. But I just don't think from reading that history that uh, the answer is uh, further limitations on speech. Um, let me say just a few words about uh, um, Islam after the attacks in uh, Paris uh, and in Copenhagen. I'm not an expert on Islam, though I had a crash course nine years ago uh, because I didn't know, you know a lot of things that people were so offended by these cartoons and why. But, but looking at what happened in Paris and in Copenhagen and other incidents um, across uh, Europe, I think that, uh, that, that Islam or Muslims, they have to confront two key problems when it comes to free speech in a multicultural and multi-religious society. The one is blasphemy. Uh, it's okay to be offended by blasphemous cartoons, but it, not, it is not okay to kill people because of blasphemous cartoons. And, and uh, I'm afraid that too many Muslims do support harsh um, a punishment for blasphemy. Uh, so, 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 so Muslims have to take this, have to have this battle inside their own communities. So they, 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 they yes, you have a right to be offended by this, but you, it's not legitimate to commit violence because other people say and publish something blasphemous. Unfortunately, I think it's it's around 10, 10 Muslim countries, you have the death penalty for blasphemy. Uh, in, 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 in Pakistan, um, committing mass murder, killing hundreds and, and people, uh, you get the same sentence, the death penalty, as you do for blasphemy. So there is no difference in the penal code between saying something offensive, offending religious sensibilities and killing several hundred people, and I think that's a problem. So blasphemy is the one thing that, uh, that Muslims somehow had to work out a new doctrine, um, uh, so, so, uh, so, so it is not okay to commit violence um, because people are saying something blasphemous. The other thing that Muslims have to deal with is apostasy, uh, the right to leave your religion the right to freedom of religion, which of course, first and foremost, implies the right to say no to religion, but also to change your religion, to pursue another interpretation of your religion than the majority in your community, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, for many Muslims, apostasy is also a capital crime that deserves if not the death penalty, then a very harsh uh, sentence, punishment. Uh, so I think you know these two these these two issues, blasphemy and apostasy, are key to um, to to creating a situation where uh, where Muslims can live in peace uh, with other Muslims and people um, committed to other ideas in a multi-religious uh, democracy. Um, so, what makes it so difficult to win this battle for free speech? And now I may be talking more about Europe, but I think it's, 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 it's also a global phenomenon. 
I think there is a lot of confusion about, uh, about fundamental concepts of a liberal democracy and a free society. And let me just name two of them. The one is the relationship between tolerance and freedom. To many people, there is a tension between tolerance and freedom. That somehow you have to balance tolerance and freedom as if they belong to do two different categories. Um, that's not the case. In fact, uh, you, you, you cannot have uh, tolerance, you cannot be tolerant in a society without having um, uh, uh, wide space for uh, the freedom to say whatever you want. And you cannot have freedom in a society without a lot of tolerance. And if you, if you go back um, in history and take a look at the way the concept of tolerance came about in Europe, it followed the wars of religion in, in, uh, in the 16th and 17th century when tens of thousands of Europeans, Catholics, Protestants, people of other faiths were killed. And at some point, I mean, why were they killed? Why were they killing one another? Because they believed the other part was uh, heretic and infidel, that they could not live in the same community or in the same country uh, side by side in peace because of this religious intolerance. But at some point, uh, they arrived at some compromise and they worked out uh, a doctrine of tolerance that meant that people of different uh, faiths could live, if not in the same city, then in different cities in the same country. And, and step by step, uh, people were at some point also able to live in the same city. And today, I mean, Catholics, Protestants, and atheists uh, are living in the same quarters in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in one city. So, so, so tolerance means the ability to live with things that you don't like, with things that you disapprove of. It means that you are willing to accept the freedom of other people to say whatever they want, even though you find it apprehensive. So, so freedom and tolerance are closely connected. Unfortunately, a lot of people believe that freedom and tolerance are opposites. And I was confronted with this during the cartoon crisis because a lot of people said to me, oh, it's very intolerant of you to publish those cartoons. As if uh, the burden of tolerance is on the one who says something. In fact, it's on the burden of the recipient of speech. Um, so, so that's one thing we have to we have to uh, to um, to gain or regain the original understanding of tolerance, and not this, I would say, distorted. Um, conception of tolerance that is very widespread in, uh, in, in Europe and I think also in other parts of uh, the world. So that's, that's the one problem that we have to deal with when it comes to the fundamentals of a liberal democracy. The other thing I would mention is the distinction between words and deeds, between words and actions, between images and actions. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's been a gradual erosion of the distinction between words and deeds. Um, more and more people believe that saying something offensive is almost the same as uh, committing a violent crime. And, and we also experienced that during the Khartoum crisis. And even today, there are people who are saying that, uh, well, you deserved it, as if, uh, as if you're, when you're saying something offensive, you deserve a violent uh, uh, reaction. Um, uh, this 
this erosion of the distinction between words and deeds is very, very dangerous to a, 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 a democracy because it, it undermines the distinction between a dictatorship and a democracy. Um, the, a, a key difference between a dictatorship and a democracy is that in a, in a dictatorship, you uh, ban words as if they were deeds. I mean, you, had a, you have a lot of things, both in a democracy and, and in a dictatorship, that are outlawed. You know, bank robbery, fast driving, shoplifting, and so on and so forth, tax cheating. That's a criminal offense, both in a dictatorship and a democracy. But the difference is that a dictatorship tend to uh, criminalize speech um, far more extensively than a democracy. So, so, so by eroding the distinction between words and deeds, democracies are in fact moving in the direction of, uh, of, of, of a dictatorship. Um, and I find that very unfortunate. And if you go back in history uh, again, uh, Michael Scammell, who wrote a very good biography of Alexander Solzhenitsyn and who was one of the founders of uh, Index on Censorship, this British uh, great magazine that uh, chronicled uh, problems with free speech in the 70s, 80s, uh, mainly in the Eastern Bloc, but not only. He wrote a seminal essay some years ago writing about the history of censorship and making the point that, 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 that what paved the way for free speech and the abolishing of censorship was the ability of European societies to establish a distinction between words and deeds. So in a sense, we are moving back to a time um, before the Enlightenment when we, when we criminalize hate speech as if it was um, uh, actual violence. Um, yes. Um, well, let me just take one example uh, to, to, to make that point about the distinction between uh, uh, words and deeds. It's from Russia. Uh, I lived there for 11 years and my wife is Russian, so I know that country quite well. Um, in 2003 and in 2006, the Sakharov uh, Museum in Moscow had an exhibition, had two exhibitions uh, where they showed paintings um, taking issue with religion. The first exhibition, I think, was called Be Careful Religion. Um, and among, among the works uh, being exhibited uh, was this very famous poster by a, a former Soviet uh, artist, uh, Alexander Kosolapov, uh, where you have Jesus and a bottle of Coca-Cola, and it reads, this is my blood. Just one example. Um, and um, and uh, this exhibition was on for maybe a few days. And then uh, a group of very offended Orthodox Christians showed up and they physically destroyed the exhibition. They tear apart, tear apart uh, um, paintings, they sprayed the painting on the walls um, and, and a guard called the police and they showed up very quickly and they ar arrested, I think, two or three of the perpetrators. And you would think, end of case. They committed a crime and they would be taken to court, sentenced and serve their sentence. Not so. In, um, in, in, in a few weeks, the case was turned on its head. So all the perpetrators of this crime walked free, charges were being dropped, and instead the director of the museum and the curator were being charged with incitement to religious hatred. And they were, um, they were convicted. Uh, and they, they received a suspended uh, sentence and uh, a fine. And why did this happen? This happened because because there was no di distinction between words and deeds. Uh, because the judge 
was saying, you know, that exhibiting these images that were being perceived as offensive were as if uh, the museum committed a violent crime against believers. So, so when you erode this distinction between words and deeds, you are not able to identify or to distinguish between a perpetrator of a crime and a victim of a crime. Um, unfortunately, it's also very widespread, uh, this understanding that, that words can be as uh, offensive as uh, deeds. Um, so, what's to be done? What, 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 what shall we do in order to safeguard freedom of expression in this increasingly multicultural, multi-ethnic and multi-religious world? Um, I think basically that there are two ways to go. You can either say, if you respect my taboo, I respect yours. If it's a criminal offense to, um, to criminalize Holocaust denial, it should also be a criminal offense to criminalize denial of the crimes of communism. If it's a criminal offense to deny the crimes of communism, it should also be a criminal offense to publish cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad because it touches the sensibilities of a lot of Muslims. If that's the case, you will also have to ban depictions of Jesus, of Buddha, of Moses uh, to, to follow the principle of, e of, e of equal treatment in a democracy. And if you do it with religion, you would also have to do the same with non-religious people. So we would also have to ban criticism or caricatures of Adam Smith or Friedrich von Hayek um, and so on and so forth. So I, I as you can understand, I'm not, a I'm not in favor of following this uh, path. And I think it will lead to this tyranny of silence that my book deals with. At some point, you will not be able to say anything that will not be perceived as offensive to somebody out there, and therefore you should not be allowed to say it. Um, the other way to go is to ask ourselves, what are the minimal limitations that we need on speech in order to be able to live in peace together in a multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious society? And to me, that is, the international uh, common standard uh, incitement to violence. I don't think people should be allowed to incite violence. That should still be a criminal offense. I also believe that people do have a right to privacy, that the press should not be allowed to write everything about uh, individual lives of citizens. And I also think that some kind of libel laws, in a very narrow sense, not in the British sense, uh, would, uh, would make sense. But apart from that, I think people should be allowed to, uh, to speak their mind. But what is happening? If you take uh, the two terrorist attacks in Copenhagen and Paris and how the Danish and French authorities reacted, um, things are going in exactly the opposite direction. Uh, France has uh, strengthened its laws against what they call glorification of terror, a concept that I don't know what imply. I mean, I, I understand incitement to terror, but glorification of terror is a very slippery concept. Um, and I think in the first week after the attack on Charlie Hebdo, more than 50 people were being arrested for glorification of terror. And you know the famous example with the French comedian Dieudonné, who is anti-Semitic, uh, Holocaust denier. I disagree with almost everything that he says, but I don't think that he should uh, be sentenced for saying stupid things. And it has created a kind of martyrdom in France for Dieudonné. He was in fact already convicted for glorification uh, of, of terrorism because he wrote on his Facebook, I feel like Charlie uh, Koulibaly, the surname of one of the, uh, the terrorists. Um, so in France, you have this very strong anti-clerical tradition where Charlie Hebdo can mock religion the way they want. 
and I think that's great. But on the other hand, France has some of the toughest hate speech laws in Europe. And it creates a situation where a lot of believers, especially Muslims in France, feel that they are discriminated against. Uh, because when they, when they say something racist, they are being persecuted, taken to court. But when Charlie Hebdo uh, mocks their religion, they walk free. I don't think that you know you can equal denial of the Holocaust with mocking a religious idea. But I think it's a moral distinction. It shouldn't be a legal distinction. Um, so, so friends, instead of answering this attack with promoting uh, liberty and trying to work out a more inclusive uh, concept of, uh, of free speech in a multicultural society, they are moving in the other direction. And my own country, Denmark, is, uh, is doing the same thing. Um, uh, right after the attack in Copenhagen, some uh, very influential Danish politicians, uh, the Minister of Justice, in fact, among them, uh, came out in favor of banning Hezbollah Tariya, uh, an Islamist uh, organization uh, that, uh, I mean, I don't like their ideology. Uh, they would like to see me in jail, and even worse, maybe, but uh, I, I, I don't think that they should be banned for saying stupid things. Uh, and for um, propagating even an uh, undemocratic society or a caliphate. I mean, we didn't ban the Communist Party in Western Europe, at least in Denmark, during the Cold War, even though they were working for Moscow and they were trying to undermine the liberal democracies in, in Europe. So, and I think we should treat Islamist organizations uh, um, the, the same way. But, but, uh, but, 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 some very influential politicians are speaking for banning uh, his butteria. At the same time, uh, we still have a blasphemy law in Denmark. It has been sleeping for many years. I think it last was applied in 1946. Um, and you, you, the Danish Institute for Human Rights, with, which is a government-affiliated institution, who is very mainstream and part of the human rights industry, and I would say that I disagree with uh, some of the things they do because they are also defending these hate speech laws and uh, trying to ban, you know, offensive speech and so on and so forth. But they came out in favor of abolishing um, uh, the blasphemy law. Uh, and a lot of other people did. And the majority of the population in opinion polls are in favor of abolishing blasphemy laws. But after the attack in Copenhagen, the government decided to keep the blasphemy law. And they did it um, referring to the fact that people outside Denmark may react violently if Danes are committing blasphemy inside their own country. So that is, you know, crazy imams in, uh, in, uh, in the Muslim world, in fact, influenced the decision by uh, democratic Den Denmark to, uh, to keep the blasphemy law. And the, and the example they referred to was, what if, what if somebody is going to burn the Quran in Denmark? And, and we will re-experience experience one more cartoon crisis. Then we don't have a law. Uh, I think it's very, it's very uh, uh, dubious, uh, and I think, un unfortunately, both France and Denmark, they have, they have uh, done some mistakes in their reaction to, uh, to those two uh, attacks. Um, so, to sum up uh, my, my conclusion, uh, I mean, every society is getting more and more diverse in terms of culture, ethnicity, and religion, and a lot of people welcome that. At the same time, the same people are not willing to accept uh, an increasing diversity when it comes to ways of expressing ourselves. So, so the price we have to pay for a multicultural, multi-ethnic and multi-religious society is less diversity when it comes to speech. And it just, it just sounds counterintuitive to me. I think if you are in favor of diversity when it comes to culture, 
religion and ethnicity, you would also have to accept an increasing diversity when it comes to speech and the fact that people might be offended by what you say. Um, so, in a democracy, you have many rights. You have a right to free speech, you have a right to freedom of religion, you have a right to freedom of movement, you have a right to vote, you have a right to freedom of assembly, and so on and so forth. You have many, many rights. But the only right you should not have in a liberal democracy is a right not to be offended. I think this is the price we have to pay for enjoying all the benefits of a democracy. That we have to grow thicker skins. And as I used to say, you know, when people are saying something offensive in public office, they are being sent to sensitivity training. I think we should all be sent to insensitivity training. Uh, because we need to grow thicker skin in a multicultural society. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer questions, uh, if uh, Yael... Uh, um... Of course. Uh, hi, I wanted to ask you about the hate speech. Uh, well, right now, in Europe, we have out of these laws, uh, like, you cannot say something racist, you cannot say anything homophobic, and so on. And um, I was thinking that maybe it's, like, every country has something like a founding myth, yeah? Like, uh, 500 years ago probably you couldn't uh, say anything about religion and now you cannot say anything about minorities because yeah, it's a sensitive topic and so on and don't you think that it's kind of like uh, this myth and the, and the taboo which is tried to be built to construct the 21st century liberal, liberal democracy and that every country kind of, every um, culture needs some kind of taboos and, well, I, I don't agree with this, but maybe it's just like this, and some people try to construct these taboos to construct the, the core of liberal democracy, like, mm -hmm. for the future. I, I think it's, uh, it's a natural human um, initiative that societies, they do want to have taboos, but uh, they do want it in order to uh, exercise uh, social control, if it's not actual violent crimes, I mean, uh, uh, I mean taboos. Uh, I think they are here to to stay, but I think uh, we should fight them when they are stupid. And I think uh, uh, the, the the problem with the construction of these national identities that you are talking about that 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 in a globalized world it becomes very confusing. Who am I? What does it mean to be Danish? When we look differently, when we speak differently, when we eat differently. Um, communities are under pressure in a globalized world and therefore there is this need to come up with answers uh, like you know anti-European Union, uh, nationalist movements, uh, religion and so on and so forth. But I think the problem with all these trends um, is that it's, it's a very counterproductive um, um, way of pursuing identity politics. That you are more concerned with what makes you different from your neighbor than with what you share as human beings. And, and uh, human beings uh, share, you know, all the same traits. Um, but, but, but in order to protect our own society against uh, attacks and in order to work out a sense of identity, we tend to focus far more on what makes us different than what we do have in common. And that's also one of the reasons why this international standard of free speech is falling apart. And I find it very unfortunate. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this great speech. I just have a question um, about you. You say that we have to ban and uh, the, the speech who encourage and, and want to promote a violent act. How do you think we could uh, evaluate this intention behind the speech? Thank you.
I didn't understand the question. The, the question was, you say we have to have uh, some standard yes, and yes, we have to yes, forbid yes, some speech yes, for violent acts. Yes, and, and that is what I said in my conclusion, incitement to violence. I think incitement to violence is the key limitation on speech. Uh, I mean, there is a difference. I think I'm a little bit more in favor of the American interpretation of, uh, of uh, what incitement to violence implies than the European. But, but, um, but I mean, I could live somehow also with the European concept. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the First Amendment interpretation, uh, incitement to violence has to be followed by violence in order to be criminalized, while in Europe um, uh, that you, you, you don't have to experience a risk of violence following incitement to violence uh, to be convicted. And just to give you one example, I mean, at the height of the Khartoum crisis, there was a demonstration in front of the Danish embassy in London where some offended Muslims were wearing placards, uh, kill those who insult Islam, meaning me, Danish cartoonist, uh, my co-editors, but I was not in London. Um, uh, so, so I think in the, in the, uh, in, if, if, uh, I mean, at least people were convicted, uh, to rather long sentences, but I think in the US they would not have been convicted. But, but, but incitement to violence is the key uh, limitation on speech, uh, I think. Western Europe, let's say, or Western developed countries and other developing countries? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, I think what we can do is to get rid of hate speech laws in, in, in liberal democracies. Because, I, in fact, I don't think... Um, uh, I mean, we have, we have institutions, we have courts, we have the state, uh, and so on and so forth. We have civil society. So we, we, I, I, I don't think that we, in order to, um, to preserve social peace in Europe, we don't need uh, laws against hate speech or blasphemy laws, especially blasphemy laws. I mean, that's beyond doubt. We should get rid of them because uh, people in um, uh, politicians in the developing world, they they say, well, you know, last time I checked, Denmark had a blasphemy law, so we should have one too. Uh, even though they, of course, are applying it in a different way, and they use it to silence uh, dissidents and critics, uh, and so on and so forth. So, if we want to be consistent in our support to free speech in other parts of the world, I think we should start with ourselves and get rid of, uh, of both hate speech laws and blasphemy laws in, uh, in the West. Um, I'd like to ask if you have an opinion to the internal con um, condition of these um, promoters of false appeasement and false tolerance, do you think they do it because of empathy because in, uh, to the Muslims, or are they just cowards? Uh, if I have an explanation why this notion of tolerance is being turned on its head, uh, um, but you know, I think if you take the politicians, um, I think the instinctive reaction of any politician is to find the easy way out. And, uh, and when politicians uh, have to deal with a more diverse society, their first reaction when you have a conflict is, okay, let's find a way to, to, to silence uh, words uh, so we can keep the peace. Um, if, you take, if you take the Netherlands, if you take the killing of Theo van Gogh in 2004, 
The, the Dutch Minister of Justice said after the killing of Van Gogh that if we had had tougher hate speech laws in the Netherlands, Van Gogh would still be alive. Um, so I, 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 and, and the examples I gave you from France and Denmark, I think they speak to the same problem. The politicians would, uh, you know, rather, uh, because you have to do something, yeah? You have to show that you, uh, you are willing to act. So the easy way out is to ban uh, uh, speech. When it comes to, um, to the undermining of the concept of tolerance and this proposed tension between freedom and tolerance that does not exist originally, um, I think it has to do with uh, a lack of understanding of our history and the fact that, 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 that kids are no, not being taught the chronology of history and the history of ideas in Europe. They do not know that a lot of people were killed or died for the freedoms we are enjoying today. Uh, so they don't know how the concept of tolerance uh, came about. They just believe that tolerance has something to do with the right not to be offended, and it has to do with, uh, with a right to feel comfortable. Um, uh, and that implies, you know, I disagree with what you say, and therefore I think you should shut up. That means being tolerant. It's exactly the opposite as it used to be. I just wanted to ask um, if it, I mean, most of us agree that to. Sorry, make, where, 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 where is the question? Here, right here. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. sure. Most of us agree that it's bad to take government limitations of free speech, but shouldn't there be at least some kind of like self regulation? Or wouldn't you say that? like to take something which a culture really holds absolutely sacred and we know that it reacts to violently isn't it reckless to make fun of something like that even a bit despicable why well i mean you you have to i mean in every free act that we do in business everywhere we have to take responsibility for our actions and i'm not saying that it's to be expected that the Islamists will react violently to our comments, but we have to know that by offending someone, we can cause reactions which will be aimed against us. Maybe speech reactions, but in this case, I mean, it's kind of expected that the Islamists will even have violent reactions, maybe. Yeah. Well, um, a couple of points. I mean, I'm not in favor of offending people just for the case of offending them. Um, even though I published those cartoons and I acknowledge that a lot of people were offended. And I, I, I said to uh, you know, Muslims with whom I met that I regret that uh, they were offended. I do not regret having published those cartoons, but I regret the fact that they felt offended. Um, so I don't think that you should offend just for the case of offending, but I found out through my own experience that in a very diverse society, you cannot know all the taboos and the sensibilities of every citizen and every group. And, and democracy is built on equal treatment. And I think it's very unfortunate that just because some people are reacting violently to what other people may, you know, take in a more easy way, that they should get their way. I mean, what, 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 what characterizes a democracy is that violence do not work the same way as it does in an unfree society. And if you, if you open the door to letting violence determine what should be said and what shouldn't be said just because people feel offended, you are going down a very, very uh, dangerous uh, uh, road. And at the same time, I mean, the people who are killing cartoonists and, uh, and Western blasphemers, they are also killing uh, apostates and blasphemers in their own country. If you are an Ahmadiyya Muslim in uh, Pakistan, you can get killed because you have a different interpretation of Islam. Should we accept that? Uh, uh, because they also feel offended by the Ahmadiyya uh, uh, Muslims, Christians in, uh, in uh, Iraq. So, no, I think it's, it's very unfortunate and we have, to, we have to accept 
that the price for living in a democracy is that from time to time we may be offended by what other people say. We have a right to be offended, but we don't have a right to react in a violent way. Giga T. Crowdfunding for you and me.